Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. And dare I say, the final edition of this season. I'll call it the 2020 season, even though we're into 2021. As we all know, the NFL spills into the next year. But this will be our final episode of the season, wrapping up a Falcons year of 4-12. and 12, Of course, missing out on the postseason. But we're going to talk about some other issues that relate to the Atlanta Falcons. And before I get to my guys, DJ Shockley and Dave Archer, let's talk about what we got on the docket today. Of course, after the final weekend of the regular season, the Falcons secure, if you will, the number four pick in the NFL draft. So I'll get the guys' thoughts on where they feel like the Atlanta Falcons should attack with that number four pick. We'll talk about the 2021 opponents. That's also something that gets established right at the end of the season. Of course, you always know you're going to play your conference opponents, your divisional opponents, but the the other opponents that they're going to face this year, we'll talk about some of those guys, some of those teams, how we feel like the strength of schedule stacks up in Atlanta's favor. And of course, there's been a lot of news going on about the Falcons head coach and the GM. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, we did hear from Arthur Blank and Rich McKay on the future of the Atlanta Falcons. So I'll see if the guys have any mind shattering thoughts and opinions about what they said. And of course, one of the biggest uh, areas every single year, especially with an aging quarterback, is Matt Ryan. We'll talk about the quarterback room, whether or not he's going to return, where the Falcons should go with that. Uh, but a lot of questions, and hopefully we'll deliver not necessarily some answers, but some opinions. And with that, I'll get to my boys because they've always got some good, strong opinions, some big smiles on their faces, even though we've had a bad <laughs> season as far as the Falcons go. We try to keep it nice and positive here, keep it entertaining, keep it riveting. Dave Archer, DJ Shockley, I want to start with this. Arch, I want to get your opinion first, okay? There's been a lot of, uh, we are we are technically out of 2020, right? But we mm -hmm. can still talk about 2020 and all the things that came along with it. So Arch, give me the most weird, crazy, zany thing about the 2020 NFL season in your opinion. Well, it's really easy for me, guys. It's this crappy Zoom thing we have to do <laughs> to do these stupid interviews. <laughs> I, and I've had to do it all year long with okay it starts for me on monday where i have to do the coaches show on zoom then i do a player interview two hours later on zoom and then on wednesdays when i'm normally again out at flowery branch like i was be it mondays i've got to do an interview for the coach for the radio for pregame show and an interview with the quarterback for the pregame show all on zoom and hopefully my internet's down and it just so <laughs> happens that my subdivision decides you know what that subdivision has been there for 20 years. We're going to rewire things. What? Oh. So now my, my internet's down like half the day. And oh. they always pick when I have to be on Zoom. <laughs> so I cannot wait, you fellas, to be able to do this. All of us sit in a, in a, in a room together and do and chop up Falcons Audible, but certainly do my duties for Falcon Radio off of this stupid Zoom <laughs> scenario. <laughs> We've been we've become so dependent on one internet connection, oh, and if not, man. we all look silly as we're sitting. Uh, okay, well, it's not really breaking up yet, but that's what oh, we look God. like if if like Dave saying they're doing internet work in his neighborhood, and he's looking out the window saying, oh, "Hi guys, I, I'm trying to do work in here. Please, <laughs> can I just get a steady internet connection." Mm -hmm. DJ, what's the weirdest, craziest thing for you out of this 2020 NFL season? Well. uh, uh, Arts wasn't riled up at all, was he? I mean, that didn't really <laughs> stoke his ah. engine right there to get going. That wasn't nothing. But uh, we've seen – I wish we could have had the behind the scenes of when we're getting ready for the podcast and seeing the <laughs> anger that goes through Dave Arch's brain. You can see – just stuff popping out of his head. I mean, I wish we could have seen those outtakes. Those – the fans I know would, would really, really love. But uh, for me, I have one word. I may show it to you here for the most 2020 thing is wearing these guys. How about wearing masks? How about here? Here's some instances. I've never seen a helmet in my entire life have a mask. I haven't seen the, the most people wearing a mask as an accessory to your outfit. And I think the number one mask story of the entire year started back in week one, where we saw Andy Reid's mask that he wore in the first game of the year and how fogged up it was. And then ah. as the year went on, the technology got better. These dudes had fans inside those masks. I mean, <laughs> who thought coming into 2020 masks would be the main storyline for coaches, players, 
people in general walking around in daily life. But the number one for me is Andy Reid's mask in week one. And he act like it didn't bother him. And nobody could see his face. It was unbelievable. DJ, am I the only one that thought we needed to somehow invent some face shield, windshield wipers for him oh, to clean no. off his mask? It was unreal. It, it was, was a defroster is what you needed. You needed a defroster exactly. blowing on it, bad boy. Can we turn that thing on high, please? Oh man! Oh, man. All right, so so we got uh, internet connectivity and Zoom for Arch. We got mask wearing from DJ and for myself. I'm not actually going to go with a weird one. I'm going to go with something that I think is is kind of something we're going to go back and reflect on because most of us saw the college football season. You know, DJ calls games, I call games. Dave does a little bit as well. There was a ton of games that got canceled for college this year. Obviously, we talked about Ohio State sliding into the playoff because at first they weren't even thought that they were going to play enough games to be qualified. But yet, after last weekend, the NFL got every single game in, which is unbelievable. And I came into this season back in, let's call it July or August, and I was saying, guys, I'm sure you'd be in the same camp because our careers revolve around football, right? That, that America needs football right after everything that had gone on between the spring and the summer I just felt like they needed that release that excitement that that thing that they attached to right so I'm going to give a pat on the back to the NFL for finding a way through their schedule matrix to make everything work with the COVID and the protocols and the bumping of games and playing on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or double headers on Mondays or random games scheduled on a Sunday. They somehow, some way, found a way to get it in. Guys, I think that was truly impressive how they were able to do it. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Unbelievable. I mean, you look at what it took daily for these guys to get ready to play. And I, I saw a tweet the other day that our own uh, Kurt Binkert put out, said, tomorrow morning will be the first time that I wake up and won't have to worry about taking a COVID test to get into the building. So, oh, man. Uh, yeah. yeah, unbelievable um, that these dudes made it through uh, all these games. And, it is, and to your go. point, DJ, I wish we could have some players on here to tell us about what they thought was the most 20, the weirdest thing that they've had to go through. Because as oh. you mentioned, you talk about the things that they had to go through to practice, to play, to get ready each and every week is just, is, is one thing that they're never going to forget throughout no the, the course of their lives. So, no doubt. all right. So there's kind of some weird, crazy reflection moments of 2020. So let's get back into a little bit down and dirty and as i mentioned the uh falcons wrapped up if you will the number four pick now of course the houston texans and the atlanta falcons tied with a four and 12 record houston slides into the number three slot atlanta ends up with the number four due to a strength of schedule dj let me start with you what are your thoughts of this number four slot for atlanta versus remember we're just a couple of weeks away from a really tight game against Kansas city. If they could have somehow some way pulled off a win against Tampa, that number four maybe changes to seven or 10, but what are your thoughts on this position at four right now? So, you know what? I I think four is a really good spot. And I think four is a good spot for a couple of different reasons. For one is you have a couple options there that I think could absolutely bode well for the Falcons and whether it's a lot of people think it's, going to the quarterback route, or a lot of people think it's possibly going to get a quarterback. For me, I think of it as this. If you're not able to get the top guy in this draft or the top two guys at that spot, there's no read to go that route. And me and Arch have had the conversation the last couple of weeks about it, and it's kind of where our both our minds have gone is, if you're able to move back a couple spots, if you were able to say, like you mentioned, win that ball game versus Kansas City, and now you're seven or eight, that's kind of the spot where I think you fit really well because there are some guys I think that'll go into that spot that'll fit your team need wise better than maybe a four where you have a bunch of different options and maybe you take a guy that is probably just because he's most available or the best guy at that spot that you take. So I'm in the spot of if you're able to somehow move back a couple spots and get a couple guys and I'm all about quality and developing this roster to its fullest capabilities. If you're able to do that, I think you can still get the same value a couple spots back as you would at four and get a couple more picks. So interesting, uh, Arch. DJ's thinking about his, his idea is more sliding back from that number four slot. 
And it's interesting. We've talked about this a couple of times. I got two quarterbacks here on this podcast with me. And Dave, I saw a couple of mock drafts and maybe they've been updated after the first round of the college football playoffs that have Justin Fields slotted into that number four slot, albeit to Atlanta Falcons. So are you like where Atlanta is at number four, maybe for a guy like Justin Fields, or do you like DJ think that they need to slide back a little bit and maybe stockpile some picks? Well, let's first of all, let's point out that you hate to be at number four because that means you weren't very good this last season, right? But if you are in the number four spot, there's a couple things to keep in mind, in my opinion, is if I'm the new coach and general manager coming in, and I know that the owner and president and CEO Both Arthur Blank and Rich McKay have said, we're not married to anybody on this roster. There is no sacred cow on this roster, whether it's Ryan or Jones or whoever. That frees me up to know that if I want to use number four on a quarterback and the one that I want, the one I covet is potentially there, which he very well could be, if that's Justin Fields or Zach Wilson or whoever it might be, then you have the ability to do that. So to me, that makes the job very attractive in another way. We're going to talk about that here later on about the GM and the head coach and how attractive and and what would you say? That's one of those, I think, little nuggets that you have if you're Mr. Blank that you have hanging there. And then you also have the ability to do what Shock's talking about, be able to trade back and garner a couple more picks. If I've got somebody at 16 or 17 that wants to jump up, is there some way I can, I can garner an extra pick? Can I get three of the top 36 players in the draft or somewhere in that neighborhood to where I can get uh, where I can address the corner. I can address edge rusher. I can draft a running back, uh, one of those top two running backs in the draft. That would be my preference, but I do get, and let me ask you guys this. If this team has Justin Fields sitting on the, on the table at four and he's a local kid, and we don't take him, and you don't draft based on what your fan base wants you to do. That's what the fan base wants this team to do is take Justin Field. What do you do in that situation when you're thinking about your consumer and trying to, you know, make sure that they're they're excited about your draft, excited about your product moving forward? That's a real tough nut to crack now. If Fields is on the board at four and you decide to trade back and you get a good player and like a Patrick Sertan at something at eight, that makes that other corner fill that other corner spot, but Fields is still on the board. That will be very interesting to see the fortitude and the thought process that goes into either staying or moving back. Stir in the pot a little bit, DJ. But DJ, you're the you're <laughs> actually the guy to ask this question because Dave threw it back to us. Let's remember the Georgia Bulldogs and Kirby Smart decided to go with Jake Fromm over Fields. And Fields ends up transferring. He goes to Ohio State, and Ohio State becomes a juggernaut. And some would say the quarterback position has never really lived up to the expectation at Georgia. So just like Arch mentioned, there's going to be some local pressure, if you call it. Are they going to let Fields get away from them again? It's not not the Atlanta Falcons, but they're just saying in a sense of Georgia, okay? So do you think that there's going to be some of that pressure with Fields sitting there with Matt Ryan at 35 years old and his backup Matt Schaub at 39 years old? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if you just think about, I know we're going to talk about this as well. What Arthur Blank said when he first came on yesterday in his press conference, he said, I want to do the best thing that makes our fans happy. And right now, making the fans happy, putting butts in the seats, bringing a homegrown kid who was in your backyard already and maybe one school didn't handle it the right way. And now you got an opportunity (laughs) to uh, get a guy like that and you don't pull the trigger on it, there's going to be a lot of uh, pullback, I think, from uh, the fans, uh, to say uh, to say the least. So I absolutely understand it. I absolutely uh, agree with what the fans may believe. That may be the best spot. But we also have to take into account, uh, we don't know yet who is the GM, who is the head coach, what style of offense you're going to run, what style of – uh, system you want to have in place. So all that goes into play as we get further on. And right now we can, you know, we can do the what ifs, but I think at the end of the day, that's a big call. And if it's a head coach that wants a style of quarterback like that, you absolutely pull the trigger. 
Yeah. So DJ, you make a great point as you kind of wrapped it up is, is if we had a head coach, if we had a general manager already in place and you know what their style was, you know what their tendencies were, then maybe you could have a better, maybe a more informed opinion on this situation. But because those two positions are still vacant as we stand right now, there's still a lot of speculation, but we'll see what ends up happening. There will be a lot of talk about this between now and the draft, but let's talk about the 2021 opponents. As I mentioned earlier, those have been established already knew the conferences, the divisions that they were going to play the AFC East and the NFC East. So you got at an AFC East that was pretty strong this year with the Buffalo bills, one of the best teams in the NFL, the NFC East, one of the weakest divisions <laughs> in the NFL. Then you added uh, as Atlanta finished fourth in their division, they're going to play the fourth place team from the NFC North, the Detroit Lions and the fourth place team from the NFC West, which was the San Francisco 49ers. So Dave, let me get your, just kind of your first impressions as the actual opponents, not the dates for the Atlanta Falcons fell into place after this last weekend, how that sets up for Atlanta next year. Yeah, it's really uh, interesting because you've had you got two ends of the spectrum. You just talked about it, Iraq, and the, the AFC East was really pretty good this year. Even with a down year of the Patriots, they still were very competitive, and they'll have to retool our offense. Will they draft the quarterback? It'll be interesting to see what they potentially do. Jets are down. Jets are going to be at the top of the draft trying to fix things like the Falcons are, but the Dolphins missed out on the playoffs right at the end of the season in their loss at Buffalo. Buffalo knocked them out of the playoffs. And Buffalo is a team that a lot of people think might be the only team in the AFC that can beat the Chiefs. And so Buffalo's team and Sean McDermott, that's a good football team, good on offense, good on defense. On the other side of the slate, you got the NFC East, right? And I've never seen so much vitriol come down about a way a team (laughs) finished the season in the Eagles management of the quarterback position. Boy, Doug Peterson, he'll be lucky to survive this just from the fan base in Philly. But, um, Giants, Cowboys, Eagles, and the Washington football team, who essentially made the playoffs by default. Uh, so you got two ends of the spectrum. Two, one conference that used to be the dominant conference in the NFC in the East is down, and then you've got the uh, the AFC uh, East, which is which were pretty good this year. The Lions, you played the Lions this year, you lost to them, and in the 49ers were in the Super Bowl last year, guys. And all of a sudden, the 49ers are not in the playoffs, and that and that that kind of tells you how difficult it is in the National Football League. Yeah, DJ, you look at the home schedule outside of the NFC South opponents, everybody has a losing record. But I would I would kind of answer that by saying Atlanta is a 4-12 and team this year that has their own areas that need to be addressed. So you can't sit there and look at it and say, they've got a great home slate. They should be able to go 8-0 against that schedule or call right. it 6-0 and if you want to take out the Saints and the Buccaneers. But what were your first impressions, DJ, after you saw the list of opponents that Atlanta is going to face next year? The one thing is I tried not to look at the records because we all know what the records are and what they say. And like you just mentioned, our team was four and 12, but there's absolutely, you know, I don't know how many was it. Uh, Arch may know this better than me, but you know, six or seven games where you got, you were within one score. So that could go either way. And now you're sitting here at maybe nine and seven, who, who knows? So I tried not to look at the records uh, for me, but the one thing that, that stuck out to me was you got to pass the lions, the jets, and Philly and the Washington football team. That's five ball clubs right there that you will play at home that could possibly have new quarterbacks next year. And that's something that you go into a season with saying, okay, you're going to have a regrouping or a reestablishing of a new guy at that position. How does that work out for him? And every year we've seen, regardless of if one division's down, the next year that division can be up. And we've seen it in, you know, the NFC South where the team that's finished last next year finishes first. So you never know what can happen from year to year. So you can't kind of, I don't ever want to group last year's team with the next year's team because we know different personnel, maybe different coaches come in and you have a different outlook. But the first thing that jumped out to me was the amount of new quarterbacks that you may see next year on these entirely different ball clubs that can make them an entirely different team. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out, but you make a great point. This next team in 2021 with a new GM and a new head coach and potentially a lot of different personnel will have a completely different identity. So we'll see how they end up attacking it once this team gets put together and they step foot on the field next year. Speaking of that uh, position of general manager and head coach, it's starting to pick up steam because once the regular season wraps up, the postseason is here, especially for the teams that get buys 
the teams that are looking for coaches, the NFL, or excuse me, the Atlanta Falcons and general managers as well has become very busy. So I would imagine Rich McKay, Arthur Blank, and the rest of that personnel department have got a calendar that's filled to the max. So one thing they, they came out with a press conference yesterday, and I'm sure you guys have probably seen snippets of it. Maybe you watched it in entirety. One thing I wrote down that Arthur Blank said, he said, this is not a game of patience. It's a game of results because there's always that question about, are you going to try to win right now? And everybody's going to say, we want to win, win right now, but there's also got to be a short-term, a midterm and a long-term goal with this team. So after what you guys saw from the two guys that are in the, the most power of the Atlanta Falcons organization, I want to get your opinion on where you feel like this head coach and general manager search sits right now, Dave, because even Rich McKay said yesterday, their list of candidates for GM, they may not even make it all the way through that list. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I sat and watched and listened to the whole thing with Mr. Blank and with Richard K yesterday. And I, I wrote down some things as well. The vision idea you talked about short-term, midterm, long-term, I thought was very important to keep in mind because they, he felt like that he needed to have the coach and the GM had need to have a shared idea as to what that looks like. That's the difficulty of juggling this thing is hiring a coach and a GM. Now, how do you, what, what order do you hire him? And do you hire a GM that can be a part of the, of the coach search? You've already talked to a couple of coaches already potentially that are on your list. We got Eric B enemy coach Sala from uh, the 49ers were both interviewed on Monday. So obviously that search has already begun and the GM is not in place potentially be a part of that. So it's going to be very important that they're able to weigh the philosophies. I know that Mr. Blank said some things that I thought stuck out to me. Um, he said, I don't believe an owner should hamstring his people that are going to make the decisions. I thought that was very poignant. He made a very, a very pointed point of reiterating his fact that he is not tied to any particular idea. As long as you have a plan that meets the criteria you just talked about, Rack, that you can do short-term, mid-term, and long-term. He also said, and Rich McKay said this, he said, sustainability of your philosophy has to be in place. And what does that mean? Well, if you win, people are going to come get your coaches. Okay, we saw it happen here in Atlanta. Went to the Super Bowl, Kyle Shanahan was gone. Do you have the sustainability to maintain revolutions on offense with Kyle gone? Well, there's some thought that we weren't able to do that. And that's one of the reasons we're in the hole we're in. So that's also going to be a part of the mix as you look long-term. If we do get back to success, which I firmly think we will with, with Mr. Blank and, and Rich McKay guiding the ship, what's your sustainability? Let's win now and let's get it going. But when guys come and get your coaches, what are you going to be able to do? You're going to be able to keep it going. I thought that was very interesting as well. Yeah. And DJ, one thing that kind of stuck out to me that Rich McKay said as well is that they are not going to sacrifice the future by anything that they're going to do in the immediate. So what, what that meant to me was making any huge trades where they're going to have to give away a bunch of draft picks or something like that, because they want to grow and build this team. But I'm curious from your standpoint, what stuck out to you as far as this head coach and or general manager search from what you heard yesterday from Arthur Blank and Rich McKay? There are a couple of things, and uh, Arch alluded to the fact that, yeah, you've interviewed a couple head coaches already. When you get the GN, GM in line, does that happen again? Because obviously, uh, Arthur Blank and Rich McKay can go to the, the GM and say, hey, here's what the conversation was like between whoever the head coaches may be. And then the GM's going to want to come back and say, all right, I want to sit down with these guys as well. So we may get a chance to see these guys for multiple times if you're Arthur Blake or Richard McKay, which goes a long way. The second part of it is when I, when I watched the, the press conference, the thing that uh, stuck out to me that Rich McKay said was, it's about the process over power. And I thought the process of going through this situation meant more than the power. And a lot of people think about, okay, the GM, the head coach, who's going to make all the decisions, all that kind of stuff matters, yeah. But it's about getting to the process of who are the best 53? Who are the, the guys that can help this staff continue to move this, this organization into the right direction? It's not about the egos because a lot of people think about the egos of this situation of, okay, here comes a new guy. He gets to do everything his way. But I think it's all about the process of how they get to this point as opposed to who makes all the decisions, who gives all the power to uh, make these you know crazy decisions as we go into the draft. So the process over power, I thought was a huge statement that I thought Rich McKay mentioned.
you know, you one, know other thing, one other thing, Rack, real quickly, I just want to mention and then, then jump into your thoughts on it. Uh, Mr. Blank said something else that I thought was very important, and it might have just kind of been glossed over, was he says, we have to acknowledge our own failures. And that's him being introspective on the selections and the process they went through, like Shock's talking about, and Rich McKay as well, about acknowledging where they missed it. And, and Rich talked about how, are you looking at an offensive guy or defensive guy? And he told the story about going to get Bobby Petrino and how that was a, that was a failed mission because of the way they approached it. So they are acknowledging and looking and self-evaluating. We look at it as, you know, the self scout we talk about as analysts and talk about in football, they're scouting themselves as the mistakes they've made prior that they're going to try to stay away from those potholes they fell in before. I thought that was very important as well. And and Rack, to to piggyback off that, uh, I think just to take it a little bit step further, you also mentioned the fact of, okay, when we've been in this position, we've done the self-scout like Arch talked about, but to have new fresh minds come in and say, okay, I understand the financials. I understand the players that are here right now, but have you thought about X, Y, and Z? And they said throughout this process, They've learned more. They've learned more about their organization because they've had different eyes be able to come in and get a different look on what they're doing. So I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty prominent that they mentioned their learning in this process as well. Not just going out and saying, "Hey, what do you want from us?" They're learning about their team as well, as well as doing a self scout. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. With all the success that Arthur Blank has had throughout his business career with Home Depot and his family businesses, Rich McKay's experience as a as a lifelong NFL guy and more most recently executive, I feel like Atlanta's in a great position. And yeah, you could sit there and say that they made some mistakes, but just like Arch mentioned, they acknowledge those mistakes, whether it was personnel, whether it was coaching staff, they've acknowledged those. They're trying to use all of that information to make this hire, these hires better in 2021 for the Atlanta Falcons. So Let's take that one step further, DJ. Let me start with you. So if you had a message for the new head coach or general manager of the Atlanta Falcons, as far as how they're going to approach 2021, or maybe, maybe just their tenure with this organization, that would be what? When I watched this team this season and I watched certain things that took place, the one thing that was a glaring, glaring issue for me was the details of the game. And I'm sitting there watching stuff that happens throughout a game. And as players, we all know about the situational awareness. And as fans watching the game, the situational awareness is as simple as it's third and 12 and you're the corner on the right side and you have the deep third, but you don't play the deep third because there's a guy that's in the underneath zone but that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to be on the deep third. You have a guy playing underneath, so don't worry about that. Those are some of the things that, that, that really irked me throughout the year is the emphasis on details. And if I had the opportunity, it's making sure that this team understands the emphasis for details, situational ball, and finishing is just as important as starting a ball game. We've seen sometimes throughout the year where you start a ball game, you don't finish. You may finish well, but you don't start. Those are things that have to be ingrained into this ball club because we saw it too often this time this year. We saw it through 16 ball games, there was an emphasis where sometimes guys weren't doing what they're supposed to do early in the year or late in the year. You weren't concerned about how you started as opposed to how you finish. Yeah. You know, Arthur said something yesterday in his, in the press conference arch that I'll kind of lead you in with. And he was kind of making a joke and he was talking to the media members that everybody has their answers for how they're going to fix the franchise, Come be but nobody coach. ends up submitting their names uh, <laughs> for either of those positions, the head coach or general manager, which is what we're kind of doing right here. But Arch, <laughs> your message for the next head coach or general manager would be what? Well, I think, first of all, you got to get them to come in, right? And so you've got to sell the program to a certain extent. Obviously, they're going to come in with a plan and an idea, and you're going to sway me to hire you with your plan. But also, I've got to show you there's six or seven other spots available in the National Football League that a lot of these guys are going to get interviewed for. So I have to sell myself to a certain extent to them to make sure that they understand. And I think it all begins with Mr. Blank. Ownership is huge in this league, and there's been no one more dedicated from a facilities, from paying guys to providing every possible opportunity to come in to a first-class operation. How you travel. I'm fortunate. I get to travel with the club. How, where they stay, what they do. 
There is not a cost cut ever in Mr. Blanks. That's not who he is. He expends everything he possibly can to make sure that the guy that's coaching and the GM have every resource available. That's first and foremost for me. If I know that, that gives me the warm and fuzzy feeling, guys, about the job right away. And oh, by the way, this roster's got some guys that have been to the mountaintop before. This is a bunch, not a bunch of guys that have never done it before. Uh, there's a good number of guys that were standing on this football team on the field in Houston when that disaster happened, but they won their way to the Super Bowl in 2016. A good number of those guys are still on that roster. That tells me that I've got guys that know how to get there. Now I've got to provide them that path to get there. And the situational awareness that shocked up Quebec is something he and I have talked about every Sunday. Since we, this is a team that's devoid of situational awareness. That'll be the first thing from a coach. When you come in, you're going to need to provide to these players. But those things, to me, line up to make this job very attractive. You know, I think we're all kind of on the same page here and what our message is. And it's it has something to do with what we've seen on the field or what we didn't see on the field and just some things that we feel like maybe can help the next regime have some success. And, and I'll kind of finish with this and, and we'll get things wrapped up. But I feel like it's, it's a situation where it's not rocket science, but it is, guys, right? Because being a head coach and motivating 53 grown rich men is extremely difficult, but this new general manager and this new head coach have got to find a way to get these players to play harder, to play smarter, to play faster. And what I would call have a relentless pursuit to win every play, every quarter, every game, because as you guys mentioned, starting has not been so good. Finishing has not been so good. But no matter if they're an undrafted free agent or they're a veteran that just signed a hundred million dollar contract, they need to adopt a mindset that every single play might be their last and they've got to win that play. Whether it's protecting Matt Ryan in a pass play, whether it's blocking up front for whoever the running back is going to be next year, whether it's not missing a tackle in the flat against some of these electric playmakers in the NFL. Every single play, we always talk about four to six plays usually makes the difference in a ball game. Can they make those four to six plays next year, the year after, and the year after? And maybe that will be the difference in getting them back into the postseason. Yeah, well, Fellas, said, well said, Rack. Hey, unfortunately, real quickly, real quickly before we yes, jump out, go ahead, real Dave. quickly. Matt Schaub has decided to retire from the National Football League. Matt Schaub will not be celebrated as one of the great players that's ever played the game, and he probably should be. Matt Schaub had a tremendous career, was drafted here all the way back, what, in 04, came in as a, as a young quarterback, uh, backed up Michael Vick, went on to have outstanding career at Houston, uh, was a pro bowler, a pro bowl MVP, threw for over 4,000 yards three times, I think, in his career, two or three times in his career, an illustrious career, 39 years of age. Matt's going to step away. He's got a young family. He's gonna, I think he's going to get into some broadcasting as well. But I just want to wish Matt Schaub one of the more gracious and cooler dudes I've had a chance to be around. Wish uh, him luck in his next endeavor, which I'm sure will be very successful. The man from Virginia exactly. who came in here to back up the backup Michael Vick went on to have an outstanding career and lasted to his 39 years of old. Uh, I just uh, best wishes to Matt Schaub and his family. Just to uh, piggyback on that, I had the opportunity to spend a couple of years with Schaub before he went on to Houston. And for me to be a rookie to come into the National Football League and for me to have the opportunity to sit in a – uh, a quarterback room and share it with him uh, was probably one of the better moments and times in my career as far as being with him and also being with Matt because I learned so much from those guys. I remember uh, just being more of a student of the game, learning from Shabby. Shabby was one of those guys who you would tell him the personnel, you would tell him the ending of the play and he knew the beginning. Like just one of those type of guys who gave everything he had from day one and supported me, who was a guy who, you know, you draft a guy to come in, he looking at him like maybe he's your replacement, but the guy helped me anytime I asked and still a good friend to this day. So uh, well said, Arch, and he definitely deserves to be mentioned uh, as one of the guys who have done it and done it at a high level. 16 years just does not happen overnight, and it's a reason why this guy uh, is being celebrated by us for sure. Good friend of ours and uh, was actually one of my holders uh, early on, uh, well, I should say about midway through my career. But when he was young, he uh, was one of my holders. And uh, I'll leave you guys something real quick. My wife and I had a pretty 
integral part in setting up him up with his now wife. Uh, nice. And uh, nice. I don't want to take any credit for the fact that he's married and he's had a, a, a a very happy marriage because that's all him and his wife but uh wishing him the best his wife lori and his beautiful kids uh, as as you guys both mentioned he's going to have plenty of success in his life after football so uh we're hoping that we have some success after in life after this podcast dj dave i appreciate uh, you guys letting me uh jump in the boat with you guys this year as we talk some falcons some issues around the nfc south and the national football league uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank a couple of guys, Sam Larson and Dan Gad, two guys from the Falcons digital media department that have been um, our rocks, keeping us prepared, giving us all the details. And uh, Sam fighting through Zoom and editing uh, as best as he could yeah. throughout the know, entire season. I don't know who, who dislikes it more, Sam or Art. So, uh, <laughs> who knows? Hey, so hey fellas, Rack, uh, hey, Rack, we appreciate yep. you rowing the boat for us. Oh, I see what you did there with a little Minnesota <laughs> reference. Uh, yeah, uh, it was my pleasure. Uh, so that's going to wrap it up uh, for this uh, season of the Falcons Audible presented by at and I'm Derek Rackley. As again, my fellas, uh, DJ Shockley and Dave Archer. It's been a joy. It's been a pleasure with you guys this season. And hopefully they'll ask us back to do some stuff in the future. Uh, <laughs> with that being said, fellas, uh, let's, uh, let's sign off. And uh, we'll see these Atlanta Falcons fans hopefully very soon again. Once again, that's Atlanta Falcons presented, Atlanta Falcons Audible presented by at and I'm going to get it right here before the end of the season. Uh, <laughs> that's going to wrap things up for us. Appreciate everybody joining us. Have a great day and a great off season. We'll see you, everyone. You're listening to Falcons Audible presented by at and 